Amen. Well, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. It's uh, such a beautiful day. Uh, you know, early, in, early in the week, it's so humid and kind of rainy and cloudy, and boy, this, the smog left the area. Uh, you missed out on some of it, Paul, but some of this beautiful weather the last Friday. We brought, we brought back to Colorado. Is that right? <laughs> it's just been beautiful this past few days, sunshine and cool and so praise God, you know, we serve a wonderful God, amen. whether rain or shine, amen, he is a good God and ministers to all of our need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, yeah. amen, let's uh, stand for a word of prayer and then we'll get into what God has laid on my heart here this morning, Father, we just, we just want to thank you, Lord, thank you that you're our great God, you're the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father, we're your sons and we're your daughters. And Father, I'm before you as, as uh, your son this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would grant your servant, grant your son wisdom and grace. Bring forth your message to your people. These are your people called by your name. And I pray, Lord, that you'd give me grace, Lord, to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, Lord, some of them we can search out and, and know and understand. Others, Lord, is hidden within the depth of eternity and will only know in that eternal day. But Lord, this morning, I pray that you'd give me grace to break the bread of life. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I hope you don't get tired of me going through the book of Ephesians, but uh, I do have a little bit of, I'm going outside of Ephesians a little bit this morning. Uh, and um, the last time, as probably some of you remember, I preached a message on marriage, the union of marriage. And this morning I'd like to talk about, uh, some of you are not married, some of you are married, and maybe for some reason your spouse is either no longer living or your spouse is not in the same home that you, you, you're, you're in. Perhaps there's been some sort of separation. And... Um, so I want to talk, but some of the, some of the uh, message comes right out of Ephesians uh, chapter 5 there, or is it chapter 6, um, that I have on my heart here this morning, and uh, just kind of a continuation from where we left off uh, the last time, although I'm skipping over a few verses there. But the, the title of the message here this morning is Single Parents, Singlehood, and Servants. Single Parents, Singlehood, and Servants. Uh, turn your Bible to for the first point I'd like to, the first um, little portion, I'd like to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. We um, covered that the last time, but I was reminded by a brother the last time that I took it maybe just a little bit out of context, and uh, I want to I share it in context is here this morning. Um, and it has more to do with wives who have... Uh, or you could, change the, you could change it to husbands too with un, an unbelieving spouse. But specifically it speaks to the wives here. It says, likewise, you, chapter 3 of 1 Peter, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands." Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. What I'd like to share this morning with you, um, single parents, or maybe you're, maybe you're not a parent, but you're in a, maybe in a, in a marriage situation uh, that is difficult. And maybe you have an unbelieving spouse. And uh, i just like to bring to your heart this morning that, you know, God has a calling for you and God wants to work in and through you in his great might and power. 
Uh, here it's very evident that, that you, it specifically talks to the women here or the wives. You know, you wives has, have a tremendous um, opportunity or a tremendous uh, means, to, a means to draw your husband or your spouse, let's put it in the spouse category, your husband or your spouse to the Lord, to win him over. And maybe you think to yourself this morning, you know, I, I really, you know, I can't, I can't really trust my spouse. I can't, can't really trust my uh, husband. Uh, there's a, you know, I, I don't, and thus maybe in your heart you tend to, to get out of your place, out of your role as, as a, let's put it in the wife category just for simplicity. As a wife, you, you get out of your place and out of your role and your tendency is to come under maybe an insubmission or feel like I need to, I need to fill in the gaps. I need to fill in the gaps here with that my husband is not fulfilling. Well, it's very clear in scripture here that um, ye wives, and this is in the context of, again, of an unbelieving husband. Ye wives, be in subjection to your husband. If any obey not the word, they may without the word. That's, that means without preaching to him. I mean, to, to, to him, yes. Without preaching to him, that that husband of yours, without the word, can be won by your godly behavior, by your, by your uh, you know, by the, by your, the spirit, uh, the godly Christ-like spirit that is within you. And so God wants to use you this morning as a, as a wife to be a tremendous influence on your un, maybe unbelieving husband or maybe a difficult marriage situation that you have. And, and just encouraging our hearts this morning that there is a tremendous power, tremendous power that God wants to unleash and un, or unlock and use in you as a wife to have, to have a tremendous savor to your husband and a tremendous influence upon his heart. And, and I'm not going to go through all of these verses, but, um, but in verse 5 it says, For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah bade Abraham, calling him Lord. And I'd just like to park there just a little bit. You know, if you're, in a, if you're in that marriage situation where you feel like your husband is not walking with the Lord or he's an unbeliever, and I can't, you know, I can't really trust him is what goes through your mind, perhaps. I can't really trust him. Can't trust his judgment. Can't trust his discernment. Can't trust his parenting of my children. I just can't really trust him. Well, here it's clear Sarah was put in a difficult situation, very difficult situation. You know, she was, she was um, asked to call uh, her husband, his, her brother, and, uh, and, and so through that, she was, she was, you know, through all of that that took place there, two times it happened, that, that Sarah was, was, was in a difficult strait in front of a, of a king and his servants, and they were, you know, they began to look on this woman in, in an immoral way and desired her for themselves. And Sarah, so Sarah was put in a difficult strait. And she could have, at that point, she could have faulted Abraham. She could have looked at her husband and said, you know, why, why did you, why would you ever put me in a difficult strait like this? Why would you ever take, put me in a place where I'm taken into the king's court, into the king's house, and I, you know, I mean, these, you know, put into a place where, with ungodly men, with men who are after me and looking upon me in lustful, immoral ways. But you know, Sarah, it says Sarah trusted God. It doesn't say she trusted her husband. It says she trusted God. At that moment, she trusted God. Instead of going out from underneath him and doing her own thing, thinking, well, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to, and it says here that uh, if, if, you, um, 
Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are, and are, and are not afraid with any amazement. You know, that, she, that word afraid basically means what, it, what we know it as, uh, afraid, fearful. Um, and, but, so she could have, in amazement, I, I looked it up once in the Strongs, I forget exactly what that is, I don't think I have it written down here, but, but it may, basically means to, uh, to not be afraid with fright to where you just flee. You know, sometimes that's a, you know, that's a term used for when we're frightful, you know, when we're afraid, we just flee, and, and we, you know, we're scared, and we just up and out, and... That was kind of what I read into this, that, you know, Sarah could have done that. She could have just fled from her husband, Abraham. She could have been so fearful of what she was getting into and just decided, I'm, I'm leaving. I mean, he's put me into this strait. He's put me into this place, difficult place, and I can't trust him any longer for where he has placed me with men like, like she was placed, like, you know, men with, in, in the circumstance that she was placed into. But she trusted God. At that moment, she trusted God for his protection, his favor, his watchful eye upon her. And she did not, she chose not to come out from under submission to her husband. And I really think that's the key word here, is she trusted God. She did not trust, she she didn't necessarily trust her husband at that moment, his judgment at all. I don't think, but she trusted God. She stayed in her place and walked through that in submission and subjection to her husband. Also, I'd like to turn now to 1 Peter, I mean, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I know that some of you in this room have difficult marriage situations where there, there's actual separation have, has taken place. And... You know, there's, 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 um, I believe there's room for, there's no room, there's no room in scripture for divorce, but I believe there is room at times when, when there is a very difficult situation where a separation may be, may be needful or is, you know, scripture brings it out that, um, that it's permissive at times in, in, in difficult circumstances. And so I'd like to read, I'd like to read in chapter 7, verse 10 starting verse 10 to verse uh, 14. And unto the married I command, yet, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So there's this little clause, but, but if, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if, he, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. And I'd, I'd like to also read just quickly, well, I'll go there just in just a little bit. Um, but here there's, here it, you know, it brings out that sometimes there's situations where uh, one does depart, but it's clear in Scripture, let her remain unmarried. And like I said, I don't believe there's any room for divorce. Um, but the thing that I'd like to bring out to you single parents this morning, if you have children, if you're a single parent and you have children under your care, is again the power of your influence. The power of your influence, I'd like to turn just a little bit upon the children now. The power of your influence upon your, your offspring, your children, and in fact your husband, who maybe, maybe you're in the same home, uh, but even if you're outside of this realm of being in the same home as your spouse, um, it says here the unbelieving wife or husband, let's put in the wife again, the unbelieving wife is sanctified, or the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And I'd just like to bring out this morning the power of the light and the spirit of God or the spirit of Christ within you is greater than that un un unsanctified spouse of yours. And it says, Thus were, uh, 
if it would be the case that, that, uh, that, if that would not be the case, then your children would be unclean. But it says, now are they clean? So your influence upon your children, even though you have an unbelieving spouse or uh, you're no longer in the home of, of, of your spouse, you're, you, there's been a separation, um, your influence and power upon your offspring is greater than that of your unbelieving spouse. I believe it says that, that the home is sanctified by one believing partner, and it sanctifies your children. So I just want to encourage you this morning that, uh, you know, that the power of your life is still there. God has purpose for you. God has influence for you. I mean, God has, uh, uh, wants to make you an impact and an influence to your home and family, even though there's big and maybe difficult straits and circumstances and maybe things that are very undesirable for that matter. Uh, turn your Bibles now to First Corinthians, uh, Second Timothy. Sorry, Second Timothy. Just encouraging you as a, as one who may be separated from your spouse, maybe no longer living in the same home under the same roof. Um, always remember. Again, the power of your influence upon your spouse, the one who you, who in your youthfulness, had desire towards, and maybe there's been huge walls since that day. Remember the power of your influence today yet. Since here in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves or that resist you. And your spouse may be at a place of resisting you. She may have your, her guards up and she wants nothing to do with you. But always remember, remember to carry that gentleness of heart and spirit. That peradventure repentance may be given to her or him. It says in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging, the, acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So I just want to encourage our hearts, you know, in your difficult marriage situation, remember to wear that jewel of gentleness and meekness, and, and, and you know, that your spouse yet can see the spirit of Christ within you. And peradventure be one to the Lord. And, of course, that would perhaps bring your whole marriage and home together. Okay, let's go on to singlehood. I want to, back to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 again. Singlehood. I'd like to uh, just encourage you singles this morning. You know, I'd just like to start by saying singles in my life have been a tremendous blessing. When I, when I speak about singles, I speak uh, about young people who may be you know, in the older age category, maybe you're in your 20s, 30s, you know, um, and you're, you're at the age, you're wondering, will a marriage partner ever come along in my life? And I want to encourage you this morning, you know, singles have been a tremendous blessing to my heart. I, I, uh, I look at their lives and I see their, the way they're being used. I mean, they're being used in powerful ways. Some of them go off to Greece. Uh, there's one of them who writes us as a ministry about weekly, maybe bi-weekly or weekly, and just, just a word of encouragement to us. Aaron, you know about that, right? <laughs> she, she has these little emails she sends out, and it's just, I don't know, if it's encouragement to my heart. So I just want to say that, you know, you have a tremendous place in the kingdom of our God, and Paul brings this out very clearly. In fact, he, I think he was single, and I'm still not convinced that Singlehood is better than marriage, but uh, we'll leave that. <laughs> but Paul brings it out that way. He, he thinks it's, uh, he's not sure if the Lord was telling him that, so we'll, uh, we'll kind of leave it at that. But anyway, it says here in chapter 7, verse 25, Now concerning virgins, I'm just going to read probably the rest of this chapter basically. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, 
Yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it, that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, my time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they, rejo- as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Verse 34, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for, the which is, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so degreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So, you know, Paul is very particular about this. I mean, he addresses both the men and women in this. I like this. You know, look at verse 32. He says, I would have you without carefulness. He, this is now the young men, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that, he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. And then he addresses the women, the sisters. He says, there is a difference also between a, between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried, the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So he clearly addresses both genders. You know, he, Paul is wanting to get his point across here that, that an, unmarried, an unmarried individual, an unmarried, uh, let's, how should I say it? <laughs> an unmarried person, an unmarried person has a tremendous role in the kingdom of our God. Tremendous place, tremendous purpose for his or her life in the kingdom of our God. So I just want to lift up singlehood to you young sisters and brothers here who are wondering about God's calling for your life. Uh, Paul lifts up singlehood both, in both genders. Both genders, he lifts it up in a very high, prominent place. And so I just want to encourage our hearts, your hearts this morning, all of our hearts, but, you know, sometimes you may feel a kind, and I know how it is in society, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I feel like the testimony is powerful, but, you know, in this world that we live in, the world looks on and says, you mean you don't have a partner? And I know some of these, I know some of these young sisters who serve, uh, and brothers sometimes who serve, but especially young sisters who serve in, Sometimes Indonesia, our Indonesian sisters are a little bit, usually a little bit older, and they face that over there. They face that, you know, you mean you're not married, you're not courting yet, you're not dating yet? You know, they're over there in their, maybe their upper 20s, and, and uh, so there's that, there's that pressure that the world gives, you know, that mar- and puts marriage in, you know, a must category. And, and then there's, there's sometimes family pressure. To be honest with you, I, I kind of remember, I didn't get married until I was 27. I remember a little bit the pressure I felt at home. And it, uh, actually, I decided I'm moving out of home and going to 
live elsewhere for, <laughs> for a year. And it didn't have all to do with that necessarily, but, but I felt that pressure a bit. And, and, uh, and God bless my dear parents. I, I'm not uh, faulting them for that. But, but culture and family sometimes dictates those things or, or puts pressure, and we feel like, you know, I must get married. I must have that marriage partner. When very clearly in Scripture, it's not so. Scripture doesn't lift it up to that place that you must be married. Scripture rather says, it's a glory. I mean, it's a, it's a place to be desired. You have an ability to serve in the kingdom of our God that married couples seemingly don't. I mean, that's what Paul... And we see, we see Paul's life. I mean, he was a very... He was very free to travel at any given time, and God used him powerfully uh, in so many ways, in church planting, in um, writing the, all, you know, almost all the epistles in the New Testament. And uh, Paul was greatly, greatly used as a single man. From what I, all that I can read, I don't think Paul was married. And so I, I just want to lift that place up. I want to lift that Lift that place uh, higher in your minds as single young people than maybe you have lifted it or thought about it. Because God and I am so blessed when I see your life. I see your countenance and I see your fulfillment in Christ. And it just, it, 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 it encourages me. It really does. Your fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ and then being engaged in the work of his kingdom. Like I said, your lives are powerful. There you are serving the Lord quietly, but powerfully. These kind, I usually uh, think, when I think of you, I think of you as having a special contrition and brokenness about yourselves. I do. I look in your countenance and I see a brokenness that just blesses my heart. There they are, there you are, giving a lift, lifting the load, often available at times in, and involved in short and long term service as school teachers, missionary workers, or some other volunteer service opportunity. I remember, I remember uh, when I was at uh, Summit View, the church uh, that I attended before I came here, and I, I, uh, I got married here, so I was at a young person in, uh, during all my t- years there at Summit View, which was about five years, and there was this girl that worked in Faith Mission Home, and Martha Zook, you remember her, Barb? You know, she was just known as, that was who she was known, that's what she was known by, a single young girl who was just serving there year after year after year. When I thought about Martha Zook, and even when I think of her today, I think of her in service for the Lord, and particularly in that home of Faith Mission down there in Virginia, but, uh, but that's, that's what I think of Mar- Martha Zook just in service all of her years that I knew her. And I don't, I'm not even sure if she's married today. But, um, so the influence of your lives is so powerful as with joy you serve the Lord. And the savor of your lives is so rich through the fulfillment that you have found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Well, I think I'll go on to the next one, and that is servant or servanthood. I'll just say servants. Now let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5, or Ephesians chapter 6. And I'd like to read, um, I'd like to read from chapter, I mean, verse 5 to verse 9. Servants. What do you think about servants? You know, uh, just, uh, Buckle up here, because I think I have something to share with us. You know, many of us in this room are employed. Some of us are masters, but many of us are employed. And either employed by, maybe, maybe I'd like to even put it in the category of your home. You know, you're employed by, by your parents, right within this realm, uh, the role that you have in your home. Well, let's read this. Let's read this portion first. Servants, be, obe- be, to, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men, men pleasers, but as, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, 
with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Oh yeah, I'll conclude there, uh, verse 8. You know, servanthood, I, I don't know that there's any training ground in the school of Christ that I have seen greater than, than, than being a servant, than being under an employer, than being at that place where you're serving, whether it's in your home or under an, an employer having an occupation outside of the home. I don't know that I've seen any training ground that is greater than that, to be honest, to be honest with you. I just don't know that I have. In my years of experience, you know, with the way God has taken me through the school of Christ, but also watching others, watching others develop in their character, in their lives, and, and I just don't know that there's any school that is greater than that that God uses. And in fact, almost every epistle has, almost every epistle that Paul wrote, he writes about servants concerning their role of obedience to their masters and doing the will of God out of the heart as they, as they serve under their masters. So I'd just like to get into this a little bit. If this is truly the, the case that God uses servanthood to develop us, then it's very important the way we respond in, in, in our role as a servant. This is very important. The way, what is our response to our employer? What is our response to our parents maybe who were you know, let's use that word employment, who we're employed to as servants right in, right in the scope and realm of your home. Let's turn to chapters, uh, Luke, I mean Luke chapter 16 now. I'd just like to read a portion here. I'll read, I'll start, I'll, I think I'll start reading verse 1 and I'll read down to verse 13. And this was a parable that Jesus brought forth, or maybe a true story. He said there was a certain rich man. So I'm not sure if this is a parable or an actual happening. But Jesus, in, but Jesus said here in verse 1, And he said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations." He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye, and if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You know, this scripture almost seems to contradict itself. You know, it says, make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. And later it says that, you know, you can't serve two uh, masters. You need to hate the one, which, which I believe that means, hating mammon and loving the Lord. And likewise, the, uh, it kind of does, kind of reiterates it in another way. It says, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. But let me, let me just bring to our hearts what I believe this scripture is bringing out. And I believe that the unjust steward here, he was commended because he made himself friends through decreasing his debt. Somehow he was commended, okay, he knew that in the future he might need some help. So he went in a way, in a dishonest way, but he went in a way, he, 
he kind of thought in his mind what, you know, what he could do, that if he should fail someday, that he has some friends around him to support him, to be there for him. So he thought to himself, I'll, I'll um, and, and by the way, he was being put out of the stewardship, so he was thinking to himself, you know, I mean, this, I'm going to be in a difficult place. To beg, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to go out as a beggar on the streets. I'm uh, to dig. Uh, I'm not sure what that exactly means, but to um, I cannot dig. To beg, I am ashamed. And maybe he had a maybe he was an older individual. He couldn't. He didn't have the strength anymore to dig trenches and things like that. And uh, but he was also ashamed to go out and beg. And so this. So he thought to himself, I'm going to make. I'm going to make some friends here. That when I fail, they're going to support me. So he, so he decreased their debt. To, and this was before he put, was put out of the stewardship. And, and perhaps it was even kind of an accepted ma- matter before he was put out that he did, that he took this kind, that he did this kind of thing. And so he, uh, so he gained, I, 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 you know, I, I gather, he gained their acceptance. He gained their friendship. And probably he had support after he was put out and they, they somehow ministered to him in his place of need. And he was an un- it says specifically he was an unjust steward. But, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing. At the, in verse 8 it says, The Lord commended the unjust steward because he, had, because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I mean, maybe we, may we be wise in these matters. Not be, not be at a place where the children of darkness, I mean, the children of this world are wiser than we are. Well, he gives us a word of wisdom. Christ gives wisdom here, what it means to be wise in these matters. And he says, I say unto you, verse 9, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, and when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. And I think what that's bringing out is simply, be faithful. In other words, make yourselves friends to money, in a way that you can be trusted with it. That when you fail, which we all come into places in our lives where we're in a place of deep need, and uh, that when you fail, God is there for you. God is there. The kingdom of the hosts of heaven are there for, to, to minister to you. I mean, God has angels that sometimes minister to us. And he dispenses them, I believe, in our hour of need. And I think God looks at that and says, this man or woman, is, he, he's, she's faithful. She's been counted faithful. He's been counted faithful. And does in your time of need, he's a friend to you. Just like he was to Abraham and, and with Abraham's faithfulness, he comes and ministers to that deep need of yours. I think that's one of the, one of the meanings that's being brought out here. The other one is... Uh, it says here, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is, is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? How can you expect God to give you a ministry or a calling or some type of, yeah, some type of eternal purpose if you're, if you're not even faithful, that which is another man's in this life. If you're not faithful monetary matters with your employer, if you think in your heart, I'll, I'm just going I'm I'm to try to get by with everything, and, and, uh, or, just, or even the money that you, uh, the, money that you uh, the income that you obtain from him. You know, the, daily, the, the weekly wage that you get, you know, that you're, you know, you're in, perhaps unfaithful in that. You use it to spend it on yourself, whether lavishly or, or just in, in a way that is with the pleasures of, the pleasures of this world. God wants us to be good stewards of that which he's given us. We're not to possess anything in this life. Remember, we are not our own. We are bought with a price. We are the servants of Jesus Christ. God does not want us to count our monetary gain or our possessions as our own. He wants us to look at them as a, he wants, to look, he wants us to look at ourselves as stewards of that which he's given to us. But anyway, God, God tests us. He tests us in this area of monetary gain and possessions to see if we're faithful. 
to see if, we're, if what, that which he's given to us, that which he's placed into our hands, if we're going to be faithful with those matters. Worldly matters, material matters, yes. It's simply tangible matters. You know, monetary gain and possessions. Are we going to be faithful? He, and then, you know, then as God sees that you're faithful with the true riches, first of all, I like to put in the negative sense. He says here, you know, if he that, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful so much. Even if you, sister, washing dishes in your home comes down to that. Are you going to be faithful? You know, I remember, sister, let me just talk to you a little bit, young people. I can put in the young people category right now. I remember when I was on the mission field, this was after we came off the field as missionaries, and, um, but I became a board member, and since then we've been making, you know, uh, periodic vis- visits to the field. And I remember, I remember specifically uh, one or two of the mission- missionaries there. Uh, at, at one time we were recruiting young girls to help out in the homes of these missionaries. Well, it came to a place, they, they said, we want to choose our own. And part of the reason was, you know, we chose some that didn't work out very well. And you know what they told me? They told me this. They said, when we come home from the field, this, and I asked them one day, I, well, I'm not sure if I asked them or they just told me, but, you know, they told me the, how they recruit them. They said, on furlough times, we go into the house, the houses, of the congregation, often this very congregation here. We go into the houses and we observe maidens and their response to their parents. We observe how they respond when they're asked to change a dirty diaper. We, we observe how they respond when they're asked to wash the dishes. We observe that. You know, what an opportunity is missed sometimes by your sisters if, if there's complaining and murmuring and thinking to yourself, well, mom, you know, mom, mom is just asking something unreasonable of me. They'll pass over you. They passed right over those. But the ones they chose were the ones that were, they observed and looked on them and said, you know, they're faithful. No matter how small it is, they're, they're a willing, cheerful servant. So sisters, no small thing. I'm sure some sisters were missed over, most likely, because of their complaining and murmuring. He that is faithful in the least is faithful in much. If you're faithful in that which is least, just the little things within the home sometimes, God says, I can count on you to be faithful in much when it comes to bigger things. I can trust you. I can trust this person with my true riches. And God loves to give us of his true riches. You know, it's his, it's, it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. It's his good pleasure. He loves to give us of his true riches. But he looks at us and he says, he tests us to see if we're faithful. In monetary matters, matters of possession, Faithful in the little everyday things of life. So I'd like to go now to Titus yet, and I'll close here just shortly. Titus chapter 2. What does it mean to be faithful? It's more specifically here in Titus in your place of occupation. It says here in Titus, servants, it, it addresses servants again. Almost every epistle, and like I said, here it is in Titus also. Chapter 2, verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters, unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Then Paul tells, Tim, Paul tells Titus, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Very, you know, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul was very clear about this. He told Titus, preach this, exhort, preach it with all authority. Let no man despise thee. This is what godliness looks like. This is godliness in everyday shoe leather. I mean, that's, that, that's what I believe Paul, Paul was saying. It says here, here uh, servants be obedient unto your own masters and please them well in all things, in everything. Please your masters. This is, let me, let me say this. You know, I just brought out the scripture about he that is faithful in little is faithful in much. Well, Here's, here's, here's a tip for you. Here's a pointer. Please them well in all things. Have the heart of bringing pleasure to your employer. To be profitable to him. To be a blessing at the workplace. That he, you know, to, to where he's just, yeah, he's just so blessed to have you a part of his business or a part of his uh, company. And it says here, to please them want all things. Not answering again. And this comes down again to our very homes, sisters and brothers. You know, not answering again simply means to not talk back. As, as Trick Schwetzel, right, Lester? <laughs> and then German. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're used to that. I was used to it in German. You know, when I grew up as a child, do not, I said that, Trick Schwetzel. That's, that means you, you're not supposed to talk back when your parents give you a directive, when they give you a command. And here's the same thing with employers. It says, not answering again. It just simply, and I looked it up in the Strong's, it just simply means to not talk back, not debate, not, not uh, push your opinion on your employer. And you might, you might even sometimes have a better, uh, you know, you're used to your work and you're used to... Um, your way of doing things, and you're, he doesn't always have his feet on the ground, and, and uh, you might think to yourself, well, I, I have a better way of doing this. But no, God calls you to not answer back, to not push your opinion and feel like it has to be your way. Even if at the end of the day, it doesn't, doesn't come out right because, you're, you're, because you followed your boss's direction, it's rather a commendable way in a way that God is approves and is blessed with, rather than talking back and trying to push your point and, and, and your agenda and your way. It says, not purloining, the next verse says, not purloining, which purloining simply means not holding back that which you could give to your employer. That's what that means. It means to not hold back. You know, you're on the job site and it's hot or it's cold and and you feel in your heart, you know, you just kind of get a lazy streak. And I'm just going to, I'm just kind of going to doodle my time away here and, and um, just kind of uh, not put my all into it. And your bones are aching a bit. And so you just kind of, you know, haphazardly go through your day. And uh, very clearly here it says not purloining, which means not holding back that which you could give to your employer. And, and young people, I'd like to put it, and children, I'd like to put it into the, into the very realms of your home, homes. It also can very well mean, it also I think we can bring it right down to our homes that you don't talk back, that there's not this talking back thing to your parents and holding back that which, that which you could give. Then it says, uh, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. And the word fidelity, um, let, me, let me see here, I have it written down here. The word fidelity means credence or persuasion. You know, in other words, that you're adorning the doctrine of God in such a way that the world looks on and others look on and say, I'm persuaded about this person. I'm persuaded that he's a believer of Jesus Christ, that he's a follower of Jesus Christ. They look at your life. You have credence. You have, you have a, uh, uh, your manner of life brings persuasion upon those who observe you, who are watching you. 
You're adorning the doctrine of God. And it says here, furthermore, it says, uh, this grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness. This is what the grace of God, this is what salvation is all about. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, and it can come down, young people, some of you work maybe in situations, or not just young people, but some of you work in situations where there's ungodly men. And they would want to pull you into their grip and talk about on Monday morning about their weekend fling and things like that. How do you enter in? Or are you faithful at those moments to teach those around you that I am living a godly life? You're not entering into their dirty jokes and their filthy language or even their discolored ways. But you're having that, you maintain that sobriety of heart during, at all times teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This is all in the scope of employment, all in the scope of servanthood, that when we're about in everyday life, that this is, this is, a, this is a demeanor, or this is a, uh, this is a spirit that, that is emanating from us. This is what is, yeah, this is a spirit that is coming forth from our lives. It says, for looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. There's a hope within you. They realize you're looking for another world. There's another world that you're a citizen of and that you're a part of and that you're not of this present evil world and you're not partaking of it. But you have a hope beyond this life and it emanates out of you. So much so that you are a who gave himself for us and he might redeem us from all iniquity. Every iniquity, when you're at the workplace, is there, are you free from all iniquity? Are you free from partaking of their deeds, like I said? Partaking of their, you know, yeah, whatever it might be that they're conveying from their spirit. Who gave himself to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good work. And again, God wants to use you as servants. God wants to use you in the role of your occupation that you, the others look on and say, you know, he's peculiar. He is not, it seems like he's almost not a citizen of this country. Well, praise God. <laughs> That's the case. And I just want to encourage our hearts that God desires the, your testimony at the workplace to be such that, you per, that the Spirit of Christ just permeates out of you. Some of it has to do with not partaking of, of evil at the workplace, but other, other, the, other thing, the other thing comes down to just practical, everyday life. Being faithful. Being faithful at the job. Not holding back. Doing what your foreman or your employer is asking of you. Just simply being faithful. Comes down to practical matters as well. So I just want to lift up this uh, place of servanthood, a tremendous school of Christ for all of us. I, I think it's, uh, you know, and I, I think we've all seen people who try to, try to um, climb the ladder of success from going up the first rung to the top one. We've seen those who, who they, want to, they, they don't want to go up one rung at a time. And often, we're often than not, you know, there's just constant failure. There's, you, we see them floundering, and then they try again, and, and you know, they, they, they just want to get to the top, the thrill of being at the top, where God says, be faithful in the first wrong, then you take the second step, then you take the third, and finally you're promoted to the top. We've all seen both, I think, in our lifetime, at least I have. God takes us one step at a time, and it's often the workplace is a very testing place he tries us in, whether we're faithful. And if, you, if we're faithful in that which is least, the monetary things at the workplace, doing tangible material things of this earth with our possessions, our monetary gain, then he says, I can count. I can count on that person to be faithful. I believe I can count on him to be faithful with my eternal riches. And he begins to open doors perhaps of spiritual ministry, spiritual 
callings that he has for your life, spiritual service that he has for you as an individual or as, or as, a, or as, a, as a family. Okay, I'd like to close here. In closing, whether you're a single parent, single, singlehood as in not married, or a servant to an employer, what God marks is faithfulness. God marks his faithfulness right where you're at. Hebrews 3.5 says, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things, things which were to be spoken after. 1 Samuel 22, 14, Abimelech said of David, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at, at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house? Proverbs 26, chapter 20, verse 6, Most men will, will proclaim every man his own good, goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Proverbs 28, 20, A faithful man shall abound with blessings. So, brother, sister, no, no matter what your situation or circumstance, God looks on at the man whose heart is wholly turned to him. And, you know, Scripture says his eyes rove to and fro upon the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. And that word perfect just means wholly turned to him. You have a heart that is wholly after the Lord. And you're walking out in faith that which he's, those commands and promises and directives that he's giving to you. Brother, sister, be faithful right, right where you're at, and God will bestow tremendous honor, strength, and might upon you. That's his promises. I mean, he will, as we're faithful, he puts us in places of honor. I mean, to, the, to his glory. But uh, he honors us in that and bestows strength and might. And we're fulfilled in his service. No matter if it's lowly service, no matter if it's unnoticeable service, no matter if it's a place where you're more noticed, you'll be fulfilled as you walk faithfully with your God and fulfill that which he's calling you to today. And he will receive much glory and honor and praise. God bless.